Hey, good evening. Thanks for joining us. My name is Gil Barndollar, Bowdoin class of 2004. I'm one of the co-founders of the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society, along with my friend Jack Abbott, Bowdoin class of 63. Uh, let me say, I just want to say a couple brief words about the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society and about the Everett P. Pope Lecture Series um, before we get started. So Jack and I founded the, the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society, uh, what are we at now, nine years ago, uh, in, with a three-part mission. The first was to connect Bowdoin Marines. We have a a uh, long and I think pretty special history of Bowdoin alumni uh, serving in the United States Marine Corps. Um, in some cases, students serving while uh, ser serving in the Marine Corps while students at Bowdoin, uh, and in one case of a Bowdoin student here serving before coming to Bowdoin. But that was the first part of the mission. The second was to recruit student veterans to Bowdoin, um, to, to urge the college to make a real commitment to bring veterans to its campus, to make some of the uh, admissions and logistical adjustments um, to really prioritize bringing that perspective, bringing that voice, and bringing those uh, exceptional Americans to Bowdoin. I think that that's been a, a huge success, and we're, we're incredibly gratified and, and uh, in the debt of the admissions office in particular, um, and Ryan Ricciardi, who just turned over that job, who was really the driving force of that, and is now in Australia. Um, in, in terms of doing that, we've got, I think, three Bowdoin student veterans joining us tonight who are current uh, members of various classes. Uh, and then the third piece that, that brings you all here, I hope, is the Everett P. Pope Lecture Series. Uh, Everett P. Pope, Bowdoin class of 1941, uh, was, was the Bowdoin tennis captain his time here, a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He joined the Marine Corps shortly after graduating from the college, um, went through officer training, and, and deployed to the Pacific to fight the Japanese during some of the you know, most brutal uh, fighting of, of the Second World War. In 1945, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor, our nation's highest decoration for valor, for leading his rifle company uh, during, the ba during a particularly a uh, horrific firefight during the Battle of uh, Peleliu. This is our sixth Pope lecture, and we're honored to be joined tonight uh, by Admiral Gregory Grog Johnson. Admiral Johnson is a retired United States Navy Admiral. He's the former commander of U.S. Naval Forces Europe, uh, a son of Westmanland, Maine, population 79, <laughs> and a graduate of uh, the University of Maine at Orono. Uh, Admiral Johnson commissioned as a naval officer in 1969 and earned his wings of gold as a naval aviator in 1970. Over a 36-year career, he, he commanded at every level from squadron to force, uh, and deploying on five aircraft carriers, which you know has a special resonance tonight as we have two U.S. aircraft carriers now kind of deployed uh, in or near harm's way, uh, you know, off the coast of, uh, of Israel in the Middle East. Um, I, you know, Admiral Johnson's uh, career highlights are, are too numerous to mention. Um, but a couple perhaps worth bringing up. He was the executive assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin L. Powell. Uh, he also served, um, as I said, as commander of, um, the, of U.S. Sixth Fleet, of U.S. Naval Forces Europe, uh, Allied Forces Southern Europe. He was a military assistant to another Bowdoin alumnus, uh, that's Secretary of Defense William S. Cohen. Um, and he graduated from the U Naval War College in a command and staff course with highest distinction. Upon retiring uh, in, two in December 2004, he started a uh, uh, strategic advice consulting firm, Snow Ridge Associates, and returned to his native Maine. He served on numerous civic, public, and corporate boards, uh, not least that of the, uh, the Pope Lecture Committee itself. Uh, he currently resides in Harpswell, Maine, with his wife, Ms. Carol Hancock. It's my honor to welcome Grog to the stage, and he's going to speak about public service, uh, public service in the national security arena. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, good evening and warm greetings. Students, Marines, veterans, faculty, staff, alums, townspeople, friends, and visitors. And welcome, as Gil said, to the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society's sixth annual Everett P. Pope Lecture. A special welcome to Bowdoin's 16th president, Safazaki. Your arrival has been a time of palpable excitement in the greater community, Bowdoin community, and I can only imagine how palpable that excitement is here on this campus. Thank you for making the time to be with us this evening. I all, where is she? Betsy. Oh, oh, okay. There she is, okay. I also want to extend a special welcome to Betsy Pope, Everett Pope's daughter-in-law. 
She is the wife of Ambassador Larry Pope, who was Everett Pope's oldest son, and delivered the first Pope lecture in 2017. Betsy, thank you for joining us this evening. <clears throat> A special thanks and welcome to the most important group here tonight, the students who are here and listening in. I am grateful that you would carve out time and show your support for the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society and its mission of bringing the civil and military communities together through its many activities, including this annual lecture. Now, uh, I think at, at our dinner beforehand, we stopped for a moment, but I think before going on, I'm just gonna ask us to pause for a moment and just pray and think about what's gone on in our state over the last weekend and hope that we can learn and be better informed by what ha happened and be with all the people who are suffering. Thank you. Now, if you came to listen to a lecture on national security policy and all the many, shall we say, very challenging and vexing and very concerning issues going on in the world today, uh, you're not gonna get that. Instead, we're gonna talk about the person whose lecture, the name bears the name of this lecture. We're gonna talk about the tradition of public service here at Bowdoin, which is a, very, is a remarkable story, a remarkable legacy. So let me begin and uh, with that caveat. It is an honor and privilege, truly, to be part of this evening. When invited to speak, I had one major concern, and that was to make sure that my remarks appropriately honored Major Pope's rich legacy. He was among the hundreds of Bowdoin graduates who became giants of their generation, growing up in the Depression and selflessly going about our nation's business in a time of great need. World War II. He was a 1941 Phi Beta Kappa, and magna cum laude graduate of Bowdoin with a major in French. He immediately enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and was commissioned a second lieutenant in November 1941. After marrying his high school sweetheart, Eleanor Hawkins, and some additional training, he shipped out to the Pacific Theater in June of 1942. He arrived just in time to be part of the first major offensive campaign of the island hopping strategy designed to drive the Japanese out of the Western Pacific. August 7, 1942, found him and his machine gun platoon among the first waves over the beach as the Guadalcanal campaign commenced. It was six months of grinding combat that became a hard-fought victory at a very dear price. 7,100 killed in action. 8,800 wounded in action. 29 Navy ships, including several aircraft carriers, smaller aircraft carriers, sunk. 615 aircraft lost. His unit then went on to Australia to be reconstituted, and that is a nice word for saying all the people who were lost in the Guadalcanal campaign had to be replaced and had to be retrained as a coherent unit. And their next assignment was the Cape Gloucester, New Britain campaign from December 43 to April of 44. He and his unit next participated in the Peleliu campaign commencing in September 1944. It was there on 20 September that then Captain Pope and the company he commanded were involved in fierce combat operations. As a result of his heroic actions and leadership during that operation, he was nominated to be the recipient of the Medal of Honor. To provide some sense of just what Captain Pope and his company encountered, I'll read part of his Medal of Honor citation. Subjected to point-blank cannon fire, which caused heavy casualties and badly disorganized his company while assaulting a steep coral ridge, Captain Pope rallied his men and gallantly led them to the summit in the face of machine gun, mortar, and sniper fire. Forced to, by widespread hostile attack to deploy the remnants of his company thinly in order to hold the ground won, with his machine guns out of order and insufficient water and ammunition, 
He remained on the exposed hill with 12 men and one wounded officer, determined to hold through the night. Attacked continuously by grenades, machine guns, and rifles from three sides, he and his valiant men fiercely beat back or destroyed the enemy, resorting to hand-to-hand -hand combat as the supply of ammunition dwindled. And still maintaining his lines with his eight remaining riflemen, when daylight brought more deadly fire and he was ordered to withdraw. His valiant leadership against devastating odds while protecting the units below from heavy Japanese attack reflects the highest credit upon Captain Pope and the United States Naval Service. So as a reference to better appreciate just how brutal and how costly this action had been, a World War II full-strength Marine Rifle Company numbered 198 Marines, six officers and 192 enlisted. They were organized into three rifle platoons and one machine gun platoon. Now you can do the math, but when that morning came, that's referenced in his citation, there were nine Marines, eight riflemen and Captain Pope still holding the hill. Captain Pope and his company were not found wanting when their time came to give all they had. He received the Medal of Honor at a ceremony at the White House officiated by President Truman in June of 1945. It was the first Medal of Honor uh, ceremony that the new president had officiated since becoming president just two months earlier following the death of President Roosevelt. Captain Pope returned to the United States in November of 1944. He'd been gone for two years and five months. He subsequently enjoyed a career as a banker, a very successful career. He was deeply involved in a multitude of civic activities and was dedicated to Bowdoin College his entire life. He was awarded two honorary degrees from Bowdoin, the first an honorary of master's degree in 1946 and second an honorary Doctor of Laws degree in 1889. He was responsible for the Bowdoin College War Memorial across from Gibson Hall, honoring the Bowdoin veterans of World War II and all subsequent wars. He, along with his fellow World War II veterans, uh, were responsible for the establishment of Bowdoin's Haldane Leadership Award in honor of Pope's 1941 classmate and fellow Marine, Andrew Allison Haldane. Haldane had also entered the Marine Corps in June of 41 following graduation. He served in the same campaigns as Pope, including the Peleliu campaign. Sadly, he was killed by sniper fire there in October of 1944. All told, several hundred Bowdoin graduates served in the armed forces during World War II, and 92 gave the ultimate sacrifice. And you can see their names etched into the granite of the Bowdoin War call it a war memorial. I would note that there are actually three wonderful memorials to honor those alums, alums who have served in our nation's wars. About three weeks ago, as I began to collect my thoughts to prepare this evening's remarks, I took a stroll around the campus and spent time in the presence of these deeply moving memorials to reflect on the story they tell. It helped me to better understand the selfless willingness to serve for the common good displayed by these Bowdoin graduates, honored by these memorials. That same level of this selfless willingness to serve the common good is in the DNA of every Bowdoin student who walks off the stage at graduation. And uh, now before going on, I need to make a confession. You all got the second team this evening. The speaker was supposed to be Larry Kirby. Lawrence F. Kirby was the real deal. He heard and answered the call to service during World War II. Born in 1924 in Brookline, Massachusetts, he graduated from high school in 42, and of course, immediately joined the United States Marine Corps. He trained as a reconnaissance scout and became a platoon sergeant. Larry saw combat in several Pacific campaigns, including Bougainville, Guam, and Iwo Jima. He was awarded a Silver Star, Bronze Star, and a Purple Heart. Larry returned home from the war on Christmas Eve, 1945, three years after he'd left. He went to college, got married, raised a family, enjoyed, enjoyed success in the business world, and was involved in his community in every imaginable manner throughout his entire life. 
Larry wrote a book about his experiences entitled Stories from the Pacific. And in remarks at the 2018 Marine Corps birthday event, Larry pulled some thoughts from that book, saying, the lesson I learned from war was the true meaning of love. The young men with whom I served loved one another, not the kind of love that is described by such faculty, facility in books and movies, but a pure, genuine love based on affection, respect, understanding, honor, and commonality of purpose. Close to 7,000 Marines were killed in the Battle of Iwo Jima. Of that number, 22 were personal friends of mine. I remember each of them, and I visit with them in my mind every single day. I have done this every day since I left Iwo Jima 73 years ago. At some time, usually in the morning, I see each boy's face one at a time, like swiping through my iPad, swiping through photos on my iPad. I see his face, see him smile, and notice something unique about him. Larry agreed to deliver the 2023 Pope Lecture late this spring. Sadly, he passed away in August at the age of 99, a life extremely well lived for the common good. He had been predeceased by his wife of 76 years just eight months earlier. They were a rich part of the fabric of his hometown, Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts. He all, it also happens to be the hometown of the co-founder of the Bowdoin, uh, the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society's co-founder, Jack Abbott. Larry and Mary Kirby were dear friends of Jack and his wife, Kip. As noted, the, now this is where we get into it, just a little bit after that kind of somber thing, we're gonna do, have a little bit of audience participation and a little bit of fun. So as noted, the Larry Kirby quote used above was from remarks at a Marine Corps birthday in 2018. Now I know, at least for all the Marines that are here, I don't have to remind them, but on Friday, the 10th of November, the United States Marine Corps will celebrate its 248th birthday. So first of all, of this participation part, the first step is be, would be for all the Marines present to stand up. So please stand up. Okay, that's the, okay, and then, no, you gotta stay standing. <laughs> oh yeah, you can't get away with just sitting back down. So, now the audience part of it. So on the count of three, I'm gonna have you all say together, happy birthday, 240, or happy 248th birthday, and then we break out in applause, okay? So one, two, three. Happy 248th birthday. Okay, Brownie, you can sit down. Anyway, in all seriousness, they have a long and distinguished history as an institution, and uh, we're very proud of them, and we're thankful to be in their presence, and we do wish them a happy birthday, and I know that they will celebrate it because no Marine ever misses a birthday. <clears throat> so after learning about the rich legacy of this lecture's namesake and the person who was supposed to deliver this year's lecture, a discussion of public service for the common good seemed like the best possible way to honor them. Now that you have learned something of their rich personal legacies, I trust that you agree that this topic is a most fitting way uh, to honor them. The topic is also very comfortable for me. It was an honor and privilege to serve in our nation's national security profession. And I have strong feelings about the continuing importance and immense rewards of such a career. Now, as I began research into history and the mission of Bowdoin, uh, which is something I love to do, anything about history, about any topic, I get down rabbit holes and all kinds of things, and I can spend a whole day wandering around learning stuff. But this was fascinating, and I learned so much, and it speaks so highly of this institution. As I began that research, of course, the very first thing I went to was Bowdoin and mission statement and that kind of stuff. 
And, uh, and immediately, of course, I was directed towards the first inauguration here in 1802, Joseph McKean. And everybody I suspect that's gone to Bowdoin knows this particular line by heart. Literary institutions are founded and endowed for the common good, not for the private advantage of those who resort to them for education. So before going on, I do want to shout out, give a shout out for the McKean Center for the Common Good. They do wonderful work in the name of the first president, transforming Bowdoin students into engaged, responsible students. So thank you, the McKean Center, for all you do. About this time, I also began reading the various remarks and speeches of the president, Bowdoin's 16th president that I found in the daily updates from Bowdoin. It should come as no surprise that the common good has been a prominent part of President Saki's remarks and speeches. For instance, in her uh, August welcome remarks to the class of 27, she shared with the incoming students what it was that drew her to Bowdoin. Quoting now, but I imagine that like me, you were also drawn here by more intangible and a more intangible quality, one that isn't about the amazing resources, opportunities, and programs that Bowdoin offers its students, but that it is instead about Bowdoin's core value, the deep belief that we all have an obligation to serve the common good. That value, articulated in Bowdoin's founding, is what ultimately drew me to Bowdoin, and I suspect it's what also attracted many of you. The theme was present in her inaugural address, where she used the quote from President McQueen, McKean that we just noted above. And of course, all of this further confirmed to me that this topic was most appropriate to honor both Major Pope and Platoon Sergeant Kirby. Bowdoin has an enviable legacy of graduates who have served at the very highest levels within every possible field of human endeavor in the support of the common good. While tonight's remarks will focus on the public service arena, arena government, politics, diplomacy, and the armed service, Bowdoin graduates have left rich legacies in the business, literature, poetry, arts, legal, judicial, and journalism arenas. They have achieved inspiring, consequential, and enduring success that has collectively left an indelible mark on our communities, Maine, the United States, and indeed the global commons. In noting journalism above, let us hold Evan Gershkovich in our thoughts and prayers until he is safely home. This past Thursday, he celebrated his 32nd birthday on his 211th day in captivity. Few colleges or universities can claim among its alums a president of the United States, a majority leader of the Senate, actually two of them, a Speaker of the House, and a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Twelve Bowdoin alums have served as Governor of Maine as well as the Governor of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Oregon, and the Provisional Governor of the Dakota Territories. There have been Cabinet Secretaries and several Ambassadors, and State and Federal Judges. In my time of public service, I professionally interacted with several Bowdoin alums, including Ambassadors Tom Pickering, Larry Pope, David Pierce, Chris Hill, and Larry Butler. I have recently engaged with former Assistant Secretary of State Susan Thornton to discuss the current Ukrainian situation. And I had the great honor to serve as the Secretary of, Def as the Secretary of Defense William S. Cohen, Senior Military Assistant. As you all know, he was a superb Cabinet Secretary and an accomplished diplomat. In 2000, he was awarded Bowdoin's most prestigious award, the Bowdoin Prize, and I had an opportunity to attend that event. It was an elegant event, this is the Bowdoin tradition, and it was emceed by his 1962 classmate, Professor Chris Potholm. So with that introduction about the tradition here at Bowdoin, the demonstrated the tradition of public service, I want to share some observations about my military career and why I found it so rewarding, but also a responsibility and a privilege of citizenship, and also share with you some of the concerns I have about continuing 
uh, public service, not only from students from Bowdoin, but across the United States. So during my first years in the Navy, from the late 60s to the early 80s, the armed forces were going through very difficult times. There was great discomfort with our nation's defense policies, particularly concerning Vietnam and the draft. Much of that discontent was directed at the uniformed services. The nation has suffered three devastating assassinations of public figures in the 60s. The readiness of the armed forces was dismal. The draft had ended. We had difficulties recruiting. We were riven with racial and illegal drug use issues. Our campuses were in turmoil and riots were taking place in many of our cities. During my first assignment in the Pentagon from 1975 to 1978, we were required to wear civilian clothing. It was deemed too risky to be seen in public wearing a uniform. We were not a respected institution. Jumping forward 25 years to 2000, or 2000, when I was serving as a military assistant to Secretary Co Kerry Cohen, it was a much different story. The armed forces had recovered in remarkable fashion. Its performance in Desert Storm had won the hearts of America. The annual Gallup poll of leading U.S. institutions was consistent, it was consistently racked, ranked as the most admired institution in America. That ranking peaked at 85% favorability in the 1981 poll, which was, of course, immediately after Desert Storm. And it, again, it got to 82% in 2003 in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. By uh, 2023, the most recent poll that just concluded, it had gradually declined down to 60% favorability rating. Well, that's a 25% drop. It is still higher than all other institutions in America, except small businesses, which polled 65% positive. The executive branch polled 26%. Congress polled 8%, <laughs> the lowest of all institutions in the poll. The Supreme Court has steadily declined, and in 2003 polled 27%. Newspapers and TV news polled 18% and 14% respectively. Well, the Gallup poll indicates that relatively speaking, the armed forces are doing better than most American institutions. The reality presents vexing challenges. The propensity to serve in the armed forces has declined dramatically. The services are facing difficulty recruiting. The Army, Navy, and Air Force missed their FY23 goals the Army by 25%. There are two exceptions, one being the United States Marine Corps and the other the Space Force. The Marines continue to make recruiting goals and likely will for the foreseeable future. Now there are several very good reasons for this, why that case is, but first of all, they're relatively small compared to the other services, except the Space Force. They have unique force structure goals and they have something that no one else has. They have the few, the proud brand that has strong appeal to the young male cohort group it primarily focuses on. Now the Space Force is newly formed, small and technical, with annual recruiting goals that are only about 500. So there, that is one challenge that we have. The second one is, uh, should be of concern for all Americans. Uh, and this is one I don't think people know much about, but it is that the percentage of the primary cohort group, those who are 18 to 24 year olds, uh, qualified to serve in the armed services continues to decline. Currently, 77% of the young Americans in that cohort group are not qualified to serve in the armed forces of the United States. There are multiple re reasons for this including the basic entrance intelligence and aptitude exams, inadequate general fitness, obesity, illegal drug use, and criminal records. This is a disheartening and worrying statistic. It speaks to several other systemic challenges the nation faces, such as public education, access to basic health and well-being care, and nutrition insecurity. Of those who did serve in the armed forces, they are being sourced from a narrower and narrower cross-section of America. It has in some ways become a family business with fully 90% of those who serve having an immediate relative or primary influencer who served. 
They are also coming from very specific geographic areas of the United States, primarily the South and the Southwest. Now, perhaps it won't surprise you, but the Northeast is by far the least productive area for recruiting. And this is not a good omen for the all-volunteer force that evolved after the draft was eliminated in 1973. In my mind, in a democracy, the all-volunteer force ought to be as closely as possible reflect the exact demographic makeup of the 332 uh, million citizens along racial, social, geographic, and economic lines. If not, it will slowly evolve into a professional, professional military with a smaller, representing a smaller and smaller cross-section of America. Over time, this could result in an us versus them minority to defend America and die for it when necessary. My belief is that everyone in every family needs to have a direct stake. In other words, someone they are related to or personally know who is a part of executing this fundamental duty of our federal government. I believe that the draft did accomplish a very important function in addition to providing personnel for the ranks of our armed services. It was a unifying function. It brought together a cross-section of Americans who had to find a way to work together as a team on a cause that was much larger than themselves. That bonding built mutual respect and trust regardless of political beliefs, religious affiliation, race, and socioeconomic well-being. That experience of mutual respect, trust, and serving a greater cost was inculcated into them and carried forward when they returned to their local communities. In the 50 years since the draft ended, mutual respect, trust, and belief in our government and, and its institutions have eroded and replaced by growing polarization. While I am not in favor of reinstituting the draft, I do believe the nation should seriously consider requiring at least one year of mandatory national service for every American sometime between their 18th and 24th birthdays. A former colleague of mine, retired Army General Stan McChrystal, has been a strong voice in this effort. And as he noted in a recent op-ed, the real product of national service, as much as the good work the participants, participants would carry out, is the group of alumni that it produces, individuals with increased maturity, civic awareness, and the empathy that comes from working with people from different backgrounds and different zip codes. I also believe that our nation needs fresh leadership, vision, and energy in the public service arena. I don't think anyone here would disagree with the observation that our government is not functioning well. It has been unable to complete even the most basic constitutional duties, such as passing a budget, confirming political appointments nominated by the executive branch, and addressing the growing debt, among many other vexing issues. Recent Pew and C CBS polls, and there are many others, those are two that I happen to look, out, look at, tell us that a significant majority of Americans believe our political system is not functioning very well, have a dim outlook of the future, and have lost trust in the federal government. Those data tell me that our nation is in an area of great discontent. It wants, and I believe needs, a new beginning. We have it in our power to facilitate that new beginning. As already noted, Bowdoin has a rich legacy of alums who have answered the call to public service in times of great need. For instance, Memorial Hall tells us Bowdoin was well represented in the Civil War from the beginning to the Confederate surrender at Appomattox. Five of its graduates were recipients of the Medal of Honor. Oliver Howard, Joshua Chamberlain, Henry Wood, Thomas Hyde, and Charles Maddox. Three days after the uh, April 9th, 19, 1865 surrender negotiated by Generals Grant and Lee, a formal surrender ceremony was scheduled for 12 April. General Grant selected General Chamberlain and the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division to receive the surrender of the Confederate arms. The following day, General Chamber Chamberlain wrote to his sister Sarah, My dear Sarah, I am glad I was not tempted to leave the Army this spring. 
I would not for a fortune have missed the experiences of the last two weeks. For my personal part, I've had the advance every day there was any fighting, have been in five battles, two of them being entirely under my own direction and brilliantly successful. Uh, so says the general, I believe him. Twice wounded myself, my horse shot, in the front line when the flag of truce came through from Lee. Yesterday was designated to receive the surrender of arms of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Their bare mention of these facts seems like boasting, but I assure you, I do not feel any of that. And here's the key line. I only rejoice that I was here and bore my part in the crowning triumphs of the war. So, with all that said, I want to assure you that I am supremely confident about America's future. Throughout the arc of American history, there have been highs and lows, and I have no doubt that we collectively possess the resilience, the will, and the wherewithal to turn the arc back toward an ascending trajectory. Simply being here on this campus with its mission, its legacy, its leadership, and its culture of turning out inspiring, engaged, and effective graduates seeking to serve the common good each spring since 1806 gives one every reason to be optimistic. Another reason is this particular generation of graduates. Carol and I are, I guess, in the fortunate stage of life when our grandchildren and their friends are getting married. We have been to several weddings in recent years, and I'm happy to say we'll be going to a couple more in the coming months involving Bowdoin graduates, including our daughter, Sydney Hancock, and her fiance, Drew Hillman, who are with us this evening. We come away from these events inspired, impressed, encouraged, and full of hope. These young people are engaged, remarkably informed, energetic, confident, and I think most importantly, possess just enough of an edge to break some of the lingering legacies and policies that likely need to be dumped into the dustbin of history. As my baby boomer generation slowly, and in my mind, far too slowly, limps off the leadership stage, I am confident that these millennials and Gen Zers will address the many vexing issues discussed this evening. They will answer the call to public service as generations of Bowdoin graduates before them did and bring their civic awareness and their Bowdoin education to bear at the local, state, and national levels. In doing so, so they will bend the arc of the American story toward an ascending trajectory. Our democracy is a great experiment in direct self-government of the people, by the people, for the people. It is hands-on. It needs special care and feeding. It is fragile. On the 19th of November, will mark the 160th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. In a mere 272 words, President Lincoln arguably uttered the greatest gathering of words in the history of our nation. Let us honor the power of those words and the legacy of Bowdoin graduates who have gone before us by resolving to make sure this government long endures and shall not perish from this earth. Thank you for being here this evening, and thank you for what each of you does every day to help Bowdoin do the important work of educating America's future leaders in the cause of the common good. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. <coughs> I'll take a drink. If um, I don't know when the president will shut the lights out, but we probably have time for some Q and A. And if you have a question, you can ask anything you want. There are two mics. You, the only thing you do is you have to get up out of your seat and come down to the mic because this is being taped, and they need to pick up the whatever the questions are. Fred, can you make it? 
Okay. Yeah, but they can't pick it up on the... Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much, Grog. And I share your optimism about the younger generation today. But I have to bring up a current issue, though. I was playing golf in Scotland with a young, not a young, middle-aged lawyer from Cape Town, South Africa. And after we played golf on this windy day in Scotland, we had a couple of beers. And he finally came around to what he wanted to really ask me. He said, why can't a country of 332 million people with the rich history of the United States, its great democracy, all the great institutions, educational, otherwise business, come up with better leaders of the country? <laughs> and he cited the current malaise and mess in Congress, some what you mm -hmm. could say less than exceptional presidencies over the last several decades. I would say going back to maybe Bush 41. Anyway, what do you see as a way we get out of this? Is it well, the, thank you, uh, is it the innovating uh, force of raising millions of dollars to gain the presidency or other uh, well, high-level institutions in Congress? Is thank there other factors, uh, or what is your take on okay. how we rise to that uh, moment that you were, have been talking about. Yeah, well, thank you, Fred. I can assure you all I didn't plant that question. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, thank you. And I think that's a concern of all of us. And I think what I didn't want to say directly, uh, but it's implied, it's implicit, I would say, in what the remarks I was trying to say. And uh, the message, particularly to you students and what have you, is uh, we identify uh, these concerns, and to fix them, we're going to have to participate. And the propensity, I talked about the propensity to serve. That's the case in the military, but it's the case across the entire federal sector, and including politics. And so we need the best and the brightest. We need people like you who come from this great institution and have been steeped in this tradition as part of your DNA to serve the common good. And you have all kinds of nonprofits and things that you do, but at the end of the day, it's a participatory democracy, and you have to participate. And you have to participate also by voting, because the reality is each one of us sitting in this room, at least anybody that's cast a ballot, we're part of whatever the problem is, and we hopefully will be part of the solution because we get the vote. And so we have to participate, and we have to find the people that can serve this nation you can be partisan, but at the end of the day, everybody has to come together, and they have to work for the common good, so that you hope there's one step above just being a partisan politician that eventually the light comes on about serving the common good. And I think the people from this great institution are capable of that. And in the past, they've served in the very highest levels of our government, and we're going to need a whole lot more of them in the future. Thank you. Yes. Um, so can you say a little bit more about your vision of a mandatory service program? What that would look like, what those involved in it might do? Um, you're not talking about a draft, but you're obviously mm -hmm. talking about everybody having the opportunity that the draft well, provided. I'm sure there's a place for art history teachers. I think that would <laughs> probably be at the top. Yeah. But after art history, yeah. what would go on? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. The, all this reading I have done on it, and General McChrystal, but there are a lot of people that are working on this particular issue. They talk about all the different areas, particularly in the public service, community service area that we have difficulty. Working with disadvantaged, working with the hungry, working with the homeless, working with the old and shut in. Uh, working in, in uh, green space and, and uh, cleaning up our neighborhoods. So there's all kinds of things that I don't think will run into the labor market and 
and hurt that. So there's many things that they can do. And the idea, again, is to uh, serve as a forcing function, which is one of the great advantages I saw to the draft. It forced people to come together with a group of people they would have never associated with or even known. And uh, then that gets carried forward when they go back out into the big bad world. Uh, and I think they've learned uh, how important it is to have mutual respect and how important it is to work as a team or nothing gets done. So uh, I think there's all kinds of possibilities. It's just, do we have the will? I think we have people who can envision this and figure out a way to do it. We just have to have the will to want to do it. Thank you. Good to see you. Grog, thanks for a, yeah. a, a pitch perfect address. That, that was great. Um, a question is, you know, the military or any other, you know, you spoke mostly about the military, but all the other organs of the U.S. government, and especially, especially the national security organs, the intelligence community, the State Department, you know, you referenced our mm -hmm. friend Larry Pope who gave this first address, um, all of them are ultimately bureaucracies, mm -hmm. right? You're part of, a, especially in the executive branch, you're part of a, a big organization. There's always, even as a four-star mm -hmm. admiral, there's somebody above you and there's a lot of people below you, all of which creates friction, creates process, right? And, and a lot of time creates frustration. Um, I, I strongly suspect, you, you spoke about the recruiting crisis in the all-volunteer force, but there's also, you know, real problems getting people in the door, uh, getting enough people, getting the right people in in the State Department, in the CIA, and plenty of other organs of government. Um, I suspect bureaucracy is a um, is a disincentive there. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's a disincentive in terms of retention. I mean, that word bureaucrat is a term of derision, is a pejorative probably 90% of the time. I would welcome your thoughts on working surviving, thriving in a bureaucracy, um, how one deals with that, deals with those frustrations, overcomes those throughout your career. Well, thank you, Gil, and you're absolutely right. It can be very frustrating. And, uh, you know, I found uh, in the service, you know, you serve two years as a ensign and two years as a lieutenant junior grade, and then you became a lieutenant, and you served five years as that, and what have you. and. A lot of people just weren't satisfied, and it can be frustrating. You can see someone that's not performing as well as you, but they've done their five years, so they become a lieutenant commander, and you have to wait another year. Uh, and that is part of it. I think the generation before the baby boomers uh, had those same concerns, but they had gone through the Depression, they had gone through World War II, and they were willing to put up with it because this was serving the greater good. And uh, I think my generation, I think, is a little bit responsible for sort of getting away from that. And I call it the be-all-you-can-be generation. And we got a little bit more focused on individual kinds of goals and individual kinds of, of ways that looking at accomplishment instead of, at the end of the day, ourselves, our families, our communities will be better if we work for the common good. So I think things run in cycles. I think this institution the common good, McKean common good. I think building and inculcating this kind of a spirit into our people is something, it's a long-term systemic thing that I think it took us 50 years to get to where we are today and it's gonna take a while to come out of this. But again, with this younger generation, every time, I, like I say, Carol and I go to one of these weddings and we see the energy and, the, and how dynamic these people are and how much they care about these issues. Uh, I think the pendulum you know, if we get enough thumbs on it, we can get it pushed the other way or we can get the scales tilted in the right direction or evened out where it's not all my way or the highway. It's what some kind of a reasonable compromise. I don't have a short answer. It, and, and large government organizations are going to be bureaucratic. It's going to be hard to get around it. But I do think that we can have innovations in leadership and management of that. In the, in the government sectors as well as we do in every other sector. We got Kevin over there. He can help us with management and uh, straighten out the uh, federal bureaucracy. Susan. Thank you for your address. I hear you saying that you're a great student of history and I wonder whether part of this change you're encouraging the generation coming up to have is a greater knowledge of our history. Is that something that you would stand behind? Well, I would strongly stand behind it, but then I'm a fanatic about history, and I, like I said, I can go down any history rabbit hole you can find and find it interesting and, and uh, 
you know, there's, there's never enough factoids on uh, things that you can study. Do I think it does? I don't think, uh, I think it's a foundation. It's something we can never forget our roots. The American democracy uh, is, a, is a special thing, a special form of government has never been around. I don't like to call us an empire, but we are the strongest uh, nation in the world. Uh, and uh, all great nations aren't here anymore. They've all gone away. And so it's a great question after 200, almost 250 years, and the, we're kind of at a, on a downslope a little bit, how we're going to turn that around. We always have. We were deeply involved uh, in the uh, uh, leading up to the Civil War. In fact, a Bowdoin College graduate in the trials and tribulations of Congress at that time was the last congressperson killed in a duel and uh, I think it was in 1832. And uh, so we aren't quite at that stage yet. And I think, and we turned ourselves around. It took a long time. We're still turning ourselves around with some of the after effects of the Civil War. But in the long arc of history, I have confidence that this will change. And we got a great group of students here tonight, and they're going to do it. Right? <laughs> you had a question back there. Hopefully you don't have Matt as a professor or you cut him out here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first thing, just thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate this, sir. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, what is your experience um, as someone who grew up in a town of 65, um, and how did that affect your decision to join the forces? Oh, okay. Well, uh, that's a good question. Actually, I had no idea that I was going to I wanted to be an attorney. I had this great vision. I read books all about every legal book I could find, and so you know, I had in my mind equal justice under law, and I was going to be an attorney, and I was going to save the world and make sure that there was always equal justice uh, in the law for everybody. But it didn't turn out, because 1968, there was a thing called the Selective Service, and all deferments ended, and I got my $300 matriculation feedback from law school, and marched off to uh, the Navy, where I intended to just stay the minimum amount of time. And uh, so I had no experience with military in my family, and uh, I'd never even, I'd flown in an airplane once to get to Pensacola and start Aviation Officer Canada School. But I ended up as an aviator and flying off aircraft carriers, and after five years, I got to go to the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And there I learned that I wasn't just a pilot. I wasn't just filling up my logbook with how many flight hours and traps I could get on a carrier. There was actually a purpose for all of this, and that I, in fact, was in the national security business. And uh, the output, at least in my mind, I figured out after five years, is peace. Peace comes through strength. Uh, and so I figured I was in the peace profession and in the national security business, and flying and being tactical was just a means towards an end. And so that was the process I went through, and I found it very, very gratifying. And I was, again, involved in policy, government policy, and so I found it all very fascinating, very rewarding, and I would commend it to anybody. And so that's the rather circuitous journey I took that was full of several chapters of, well, I'd call it blind luck and serendipity, but Anyway, that's how I ended up where I ended up. Thank you. Thanks, Grog. Um, I'm actually glad the student went first because it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tee up the question I have. Really appreciate the remarks. Incredibly gracious. Um, you are the epitome of a Mainer. You were wonderfully self-effacing. So we didn't hear as much about your career and how it spanned. And I wondered if you might be able to give an example or two examples because you're career in the military, in national security and policy spanned pretty significant and tumultuous part of the past 50 years or so of U.S. history. What is an example concrete from your time in service, either directly with the armed forces or working in Washington, D.C., that helped frame your view of thinking about the common good 
And what is something you saw that maybe gives you caution and makes you maybe a little bit concerned as you also expressed in your remarks tonight? So a positive example from your own career and personal experience, an example that maybe gives you a little bit of pause and concern and humility. Well, <clears throat> I had t so many positive examples. And again, it comes down to mentors and role models and, and uh, people that, you know, you get upset about something and you get the old shovel out and you start digging the hole and someone would come and knock, tap you on the shoulder and say, let me break the handle off that shovel before you get that hole too deep. And uh, so I had a lot of people that rescued me from myself along the way. And, uh, and then uh, that was probably in the earlier stages when you were, I guess, a little, allegedly uh, quite a bit more immature. I don't know if I ever got mature. But I did have the opportunity to work for some wonderful role models who I considered to be great statesmen and great leaders. And the two of them in particular were General Powell and Secretary Cohen. And they also were superb diplomats. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, the, the, my profession, we're in the caboose. The State Department is head of national security policy and representing the United States of America around the world. And we're just an instrument. We should be, like I said, you know, peace through strength. And we should be a, a strong back for them and to help them. But I think our country has uh, diminished the role of the State Department and the authority and power of our ambassadors and, and, and even all of the executive branches, because it's going tighter and tighter and tighter uh, into the White House and into the executive branch, which again, Part of that is Congress's fault because they don't, they write imprecise policy because they don't want to make a hard decision or they don't make any policy at all. So then it goes to the executive branch and, and, uh, and that's another reason why it ends up being adjudicated in the Supreme Court. These are all policy issues and that politicizes the Supreme Court. And it goes on and on and on. But I think, uh, uh, so the, the one was role models and uh, the other thing I saw, maybe because I worked in Washington quite a bit and worked around, uh, is uh, I think a characteristic that Mainers have. I like to think that those who graduate from this institution have, and that's uh, a, profo uh, a, a profound level of humility. And what I saw in Washington, of course, was a lot of talented people, but you know, it wasn't self-confidence and the ability to operate in that environment it slipped into hubris, and it became a big log that they just stumbled over. And so that balance, you have to have confidence. You have to be self-assured, but you have to do it in a humble way. And I think when you go out in the world with an education from an institution like this, that should give you the ability to know that you can compete with any ideas out there and with anybody, but you can do it in a respectful way, a, a way of mutual respect and listen to all points of view, and at the end of the day, uh, come up with something. Everybody has to leave a chip on the table, by the way, when you get around to having a democracy work. You can't have it be my way or the highway, or democracy simply won't work. So I think uh, uh, hoping that you can find uh, role models, and you can search them out, uh, mentors and role models. You know, Don't wait for them to come to you. Although if you have talent, they'll come to you. And, uh, but seek them out and seek their help. And the other thing is, just always remain respectful and humble would be my recommendation. And I just saw so many people stumble over that and, uh, and not working for the common good. Okay, we'll go to the back, the gentleman with the brown coat. Thank you very much for uh, coming here tonight. Uh, you mentioned your po a policy of mandatory service, and obviously such a policy would affect certain people more than others, especially mm -hmm. young people. And mm -hmm. young people might raise the concern of, if my parents didn't serve, didn't have to serve, why should I? Why should I have, mm -hmm. have to plan to mandatory service? I might see it as pressing on uh, a duty on an older generation, mm -hmm. pressing on a duty to the younger generation. So my question to you is, if that's a policy that you think is necessary to pursue, how do you convince the younger generation that it is worthwhile for them? 
Well, I, I would hope that they would agree with it. Uh, I think that it is part of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to live in this great country. And if you don't have a functioning government, what, what kind of things do you like to do? What's your favorite thing? I mean, like, what issue? Like climate change or uh, I don't know what. what? Yeah. Well, what, you know, whatever your issue is, whatever nonprofit you want to work with, whatever, if we don't have a functioning government and we don't have a, 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 some means to secure our shores, and protect our people, all that's going to be for naught. So I think you can say in a kind of a perverted way or a convoluted way that it boils down to self-interest. It's, it's in your self-interest to do that. Because like I said, and like what General McChrystal said in his op-ed piece, what comes out of it is people that have worked with others, people that they would never ever have the opportunity to associate with, and they're working for some higher purpose. And at the end of the day, you'll bring that back into your business world, into your community, and it'll be more functioning, it'll be better for your kids, it'll be better for your family, it'll be better for your community. So I think it's a, I'd say a self-licking ice cream cone. I mean, it, it is, it's a virtuous, virtuous cycle, and you just want, you just want to do that. It, it's goodness. And so I think it speaks for itself. And I don't know how that's taught here, but it, it'll be in your DNA when you go walk across the stage. What year are you? Okay, so in 2026, it'll be a nice sunny day in late May, I'm sure of that. <laughs> and uh, you'll have all the things you need to go out there and take on these challenges. So I think it's in, it's in your self-interest. Well, that's how I would look at it. And I would be, I think, uh, I hope your parents, in reflection, would say they missed an opportunity for that. Uh, in their years since the end of the draft. In the gray sweater. And then we'll get to the young lady right here. Hello, Admiral Johnson. Thank you very much for the talk and for your time. Um, this is a bit of a gloomy question, potentially. But I was okay. in a... Yeah, I was in a class called... Uh, uh, what was it called, Professor? Rome? Rome, Rome. And, uh, yeah, idea of Rome. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I got oh. your question. But basically, the idea was that we were studying the Roman Empire and the political theory in the Roman Empire. I think one of the reflections I had was that basically all empires come to an end, right? Mm -hmm. The Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, uh, the British Empire, and obviously you don't want to use the term empire for America. But, no. But American hegemony will probably at some point end, won't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I, that's kind of a question to you, really. What do you think about that? Do you think... American hegemony will end at some point, and then is that a bad day for the world? Uh, well, I know that was your question, Professor, but yeah. Well, I, uh, I don't like the word hegemony either, but we are the dominant yeah, yeah, yeah. power in the world whether we want to face up to it or not, both economically, and I think in, in as, as many imperfections as it does, our form of government, that brings out the best in all of our citizens so we can harness the power of all 332 million of us. Uh, it is as good as there is. And you can see uh, in Ukraine, you can see what's happening in the Middle East, you can see in Western Pacific, uh, if the United States isn't there in some way, shape, or form, it just doesn't happen. Like the EU is comparable to us in economic power, and I guess you could aggregate all their military. I don't think it would still be the same as ours, but it's 30-something independent sovereign states. And so to work in a coherent, cohesive force, they'll never just have the throw weight of the United States. So um, whether we want to or not, we're going to be part of it. I hope that we can always do it in a humble way. Mm -hmm. I think that we can do it in uh, ways that are least harmful. When you get to some of these hard decisions, uh, you're often faced with what is the least worst option. And there they're just aren't easy ones. And uh, I think it's to be determined whether the, this great experiment that started almost 250 years ago, whether it's going to be able to continue or not. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's going to depend upon you. And I'll have to say that I'm sorry, but our, my generation left quite a few vexing issues for you. Mm 
but I have no doubt that, again, the, the, the ebb and flow of history, the arc of history, it's always, I hope, going up and right. Uh, but the amplitude of that arc changes quite a bit. And right now, I don't think there's much amplitude in that arc. And so hopefully, uh, you folks will have better success than my generation did. So I don't have a hard answer, but I think for the time being, the United States will be. But we have to be humble. I mentioned uh, the State Department. I think we've made a huge error, but that's always something Congress can agree on, cut their spending because they don't have a constituency here in the United States. And so I think that's a big mistake. And uh, we need to have dynamic, talented ambassadors like those ambassadors that I named that I had worked for, people like Ambassador Pickering, who was a six-time ambassador and the number three in the State Department in his last assignment. And uh, we need a lot of them. And we need to empower them, and we need to just work with people in a humble, quiet way, because I think the hand of America is critical for almost every single major security issue we have. And we have finite bandwidth, and so we need to have lots of allies helping us. Unfortunately, the Southern Hemisphere is not getting much attention these days. And th their issues will be on us. It's already coming across the Mediterranean and what have you if we don't start working with them. So there's a lot to do, but I think the United States will have to be part of it. Right. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. That's a, as good a non-answer as I can give you. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, yeah. My question is, how strong a role does the military play in shaping our current leaders? And if we're dissatisfied with them, how does the military have to evolve or change to change that narrative? Uh, what was the first part of it? How strong a role does the military play in shaping current leaders, current national leaders? Well, I don't think we have any, we have one vote just like you, you do. Are you 21? 18. Oh, well, you're going to vote in the next election then, not 2024, but in 2028. Oh, you get the by-election in 2026, you can vote. But uh, that's an, imp um, uh, uh, an important uh, part of it, but um, I've lost my thread here. Restate your question. How, how strong a role does the military oh, play in yeah. shaping current nationalism? Well, I don't, again, we don't shape the, the, we are asked our opinion, we're, we're, we're required by law to provide your best military advice. You're supposed to remain apolitical. I am, I'm unaffiliated. I don't sign, go with any political party and I don't think you should. Um, and by the, by the Constitution, we're supposed to provide our best military advice without any uh, politics into it. Now, you're dealing in a political environment and your immediate superior in command, i.e. the Secretary of All Defense, is a political appointee. So if you're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and you don't take some of those realities into account, you're probably not going to last in that job very well. But you do have to walk a very tight uh, uh, line and uh, try to stay out of politics as much as you can. I served, I think, under eight presidents, seven presidents, and as far as I was concerned, they were the commander in chief and I was proud to be uh, in the United States of America and have them to be my commander in chief and I would do everything I can to support their policies. And there are policies that you have to uh, support even if you might not think that they're a real good one, like, for instance, invading Iraq. Uh, but I don't believe that I should resign. An officer can resign, but an enlisted person can't. And I'm supposed to be the leader and so if there's a policy that you might not disagree with, uh, I don't feel that I should resign. I have to give my best military advice, but then you have to follow, as long as it's a lawful order, you have to follow that order. And, uh, uh, and the, those decisions, if you have a president who's making a lot of bad decisions, it's up to you folks to make sure that person doesn't get elected again. And think about those things when you elect these people that they're gonna send the sons and daughters of America off to do some pretty nasty stuff. And some of them aren't gonna come home. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that about does it. Uh, thank you for your patience.
And again, I can't tell you how profoundly impressed I am by this institution. And I'm so delighted that we had this many students here tonight. And thank you all for being here. Good luck to all of you. And I'll be looking forward to reading all about you in the newspapers. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to thank, thank Rog again uh, for a fantastic lecture. And I want to give you a small token of our thanks from the Bowdoin Marine Corps Society and, and by our, uh, our friend and supporter, Betsy Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, it really, I could have gone either way. Ambassador Lawrence Pope, Larry Pope, our, our friend and our first lecturer, wrote two books. And I recommend to students something you brought up. His first book was called The Demilitarization of American, American Foreign Policy or American Diplomacy, Two Cheers for Striped Pants. And you can definitely find copies online. I think it's still in print. Um, that's a great, and I, for busy students, a pretty short um, take on that topic that's got a lot of personal experience, and I'd, I'd highly recommend that. His other book, um, perhaps even, even slightly more appropriate tonight, Among Heroes, a Marine Rifle Company on Peleliu, is the, uh, the, journal, the journal of his father's first sergeant uh, in that battle in which he earned the Medal of Honor. So I want to give you this copy from us through Betsy, uh, and thank you again for tonight. Thank you, Gil. Pleasure. I'll treasure this. Thank you.